Ever since that first trailer dropped, Junk World was on the radar of every fan of Ironhide games. Even their last game, Legends of Kingdom Rush, which was still freshly released when the trailer aired, took sort of a backseat to the hype for Junk World. Now that it's finally here, the game has a lot of anticipation to live up to. I played this game as early as I could, and unlocked nearly everything at this point. However, I found myself unable to enjoy the majority of the experience. As someone who is a huge fan of Ironhide games, I consider it an even bigger deal that I didn't have fun with this game. I have to wonder if there's simply something that I'm not getting about this game that other people are. Being a limited release, the game still has a lot of time and room for improvement. That's why I want to take the time to explain my issues with the game so that they can hopefully be fixed down the road. First of all, I want to clarify that exclusivity has no effect on my enjoyment of a game. I didn't hold it against Legends of Kingdom Rush at all, and I have no intention of holding it against any other games either. So the fact that Junk World has a limited release doesn't matter to me. It's certainly unfortunate that it can only be downloaded on the Google Play Store and only shows up in Uruguay, Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom, and New Zealand. However, it's not like the act of playing the game itself is altered at all by this, so this isn't one of my critiques of the game. What I consider a valid critique would be something like an energy system. An energy system is where the game makes you spend a resource, that being energy, to play levels. The energy goes up slowly over time so that you can keep playing again, or you can spend real world money to get more energy sooner. Ironhide has always done a good job at making their games not feel like corporate mobile games because they weren't overly monetized. I know that Vengeance pushed the boundaries with premium towers, but it wasn't so extreme that it was unforgivable to me. But something like an energy system directly affects the gameplay. It's a bad model in any video game because it locks you away from playing a game that you own. You also can't even watch ads for more energy if you aren't playing in an area that gives you a sufficient internet connection, since the ads won't load. In the case of Junk World, needing energy to play levels is especially bad because the game is not easy. It's no surprise that Ironhide makes tough games, and Junk World is arguably the hardest Ironhide game yet. But when a game isn't enjoyable, being difficult only makes it even less tolerable to try to play it. The gameplay for Junk World is pretty different from Kingdom Rush, despite still being a tower defense game. I actually don't play many tower defense games. This is mostly because the freedom to build towers on any spot on the map is overwhelming with too many choices. Kingdom Rush was less overwhelming by giving you strategic points which guided you to build towers in specific areas. Junk World goes with the more traditional tower defense game route by allowing you to build towers anywhere that isn't obstructed by the path or other scenery. But for the aforementioned reasons, this is a downgrade from Ironhide's other tower defense games. The levels don't feel carefully crafted anymore, at least not to the same extent. Consequently, the tower placements that you end up making feel haphazard and somewhat messy. The decision making process for building towers often boils down to wrapping towers around paths that optimize their range, clumping them together to try to force a choke point, or just lining them up to deal as much damage in the lane as possible. The game just doesn't feel as strategic as it should in order to be more enjoyable. But before I elaborate on that, I need to explain how exactly the gameplay works. Each level has two modes, Build Mode and Defend Mode. Every level starts in Build Mode. In Build Mode, there are no enemies, but you can see which enemies the upcoming wave contains as well as the direction that the enemies will go in. Here, you build your towers based on what you think might be a good idea. You can also nudge your towers around or sell them. When you're done with all of that, you hit the button in the bottom right corner to finish build mode. This is when you can move on to defend mode, which is where you can place tactics on the path and micro your units. The enemies will spawn and it's up to the player to survive. After the wave finishes and all enemies are either dead or got through the exit, you enter build mode again and the process repeats until the third defend mode, which is the last wave of the level. During build mode, you can only see the enemies that will spawn during the very next defend mode. So, at the start of the level, you have no idea what to expect following this. Even with the current wave information, you have no idea what formations the enemies will take until they start spawning. This is totally fine in a normal game that doesn't require energy to play it. But because Junk World makes you spend energy to play levels, you're using up valuable resources just to engage in trial and error. 
It's not really the player's fault if they fail at something they couldn't see coming. So the energy system automatically adds frustration to the gameplay because it makes you waste energy for losing to something that you don't have enough information to beat yet. It kills the enthusiasm to move on to the next level when you know that you could sink all of your energy into trial and error and still might not win with the energy you have. Progression works differently in Junk World as well. There are levels that unlock multiple other levels, and those new levels can unlock multiple other levels as well. If you look at this diagram here, it shows the order in which levels unlock. The green circled spot is the first level, and the red circled spot is the boss level. If you move along the blue path only, you can beeline straight to the boss stage without doing any of the other missions. Alternatively, if you go along the black paths, they will lead to the dead ends. But these colored paths are not present in the actual game. There is no indication of which levels unlock which other ones. This non-linear progression would destroy any sense of logic to the game's story. But don't worry, because there isn't any story that you're missing out on anyways. There are no descriptions attached to any of the levels. You just go and kill things in one area, and then the next. It doesn't make it any less hollow, but since there's no story to get broken up by this progression in the first place, I can't technically complain about the story progression in that regard. What I can complain about is how this lack of structure means that you can reach the end game early if you beeline the levels that lead to the area's boss fight. As for the ones that don't contribute to story progression, the energy system makes those less desirable to play since you're spending energy to play missions that don't lead anywhere in the end. And since players aren't given any information regarding which levels unlock what, you can unknowingly blow all of your energy on levels that don't matter, or accidentally get to the end game without intending to yet, leading to a massive anticlimax when you play the other levels after beating the last stage in the story. Next, let's talk about towers. The game gives you a handful of towers to start off with, and these are the Machine Gunner, Sniper, Underground Warriors, and Fire Trucker. Similar to Vengeance, you can equip a number of towers to bring into a level. Those will be the only towers you can build during that level. In Junk World, the limit is 4. Towers also have a built-in ability that they can use during defend mode. The ability is different for each tower, and is usually an extension of what the tower already does. For example, the sniper gets a powerful critical shot, the fire trucker throws an explosive that spreads fire over a bigger AoE, and so on. You know when a tower's ability is ready to be used when they have a yellow arrow pointing down at them, prompting you to click on the tower. It's only once you touch the tower that the ability gets used. The idea is that you can control when to use it at the most opportune time. While it may be well intentioned, the abilities are actually a perfect example of the energy system making other parts of the game more frustrating. Tower skills do not recharge quickly. You might get two ideal situations for an ability over the course of an entire level. In other words, it's a big deal to use a skill. So, if you happen to misjudge a situation, or just slip up and activate the ability at a bad time, it's a huge loss. In the process of trial and error to beat a level, you have to combine a working strategy along with well-timed skills in order to come out on top. It can be frustrating enough already to perform that well in the level, but now you have the added frustration of watching your energy go to waste because of an easy-to-make mistake. Imagine mistiming an ability and then not being able to play the game for a couple of hours afterwards. This is worse than just not being fun, it's actively infuriating. The mere presence of tower abilities also makes it harder to know if you lost because of your strategy or just because of your ability usage. So if you lose a level, you can end up retrying it, intending to use your abilities differently than last time, and still lose the level because it ended up being your strategy that was the problem instead of your ability usage. The player ends up wasting even more energy to have to start trying something new, which takes me back to the point about energy making the game more frustrating than fun. When it comes to tower balance, the game is all over the place. First, there is a huge amount of RNG involved in some towers. For example, the sniper's maximum damage is two and a half times the amount of its minimum damage. On a slow attacking tower, this makes a huge difference, because the sniper might only get one chance to shoot at a particular enemy, so if you get bad RNG, there's nothing you can do about that. How are players supposed to know if they need to update their strategy or if they just got unlucky during an attempt at a level. The only way is by playing that level again under the same conditions to see if anything changes, which is going to cost more energy. Now imagine playing a level only to get bad luck with the tower's damage, and having the energy you spent go to waste because of that. This is a perfect example of Jungworld's design decisions stacking together to make the experience more frustrating.
But there are also other problems with towers besides RNG. All towers that spawn units are instantly bad in this game for two reasons. Primarily, they are outclassed by tactics, but more about those later. The second reason is that the levels are designed to discourage choke points. You can still make choke points, but not with these towers. The Underground Warriors Tower is an especially egregious example. The units it spawns will walk down the path, engaging with enemies outside of the range of your other towers. It does more harm than good when you're not struggling to hold back enemies, but also gets easily overwhelmed at defending a lane. It also can't be rallied, so if you build it near multiple paths, it would choose one path to support the entire time. Though this is the worst of the barracks towers, the other ones suffer too from being too weak to hold out on their own. Look at the Waste Disposer's total inability to block enemies, which is the only thing it exists to do. Barracks are an entire class of tower that has become useless in Junk World. The Mad Scientist Tower is proof that even the Blazing Gem can be bad. It works in the same way, shooting a beam that deals increasing damage over time. Probably out of fear that it would be too strong yet again, the damage of the Mad Scientist was made extremely low. It can't effectively counter the tanky enemies that it should exist to counter. Additionally, because most enemies in the game aren't even that tanky on their own, it's better to just get something that has more universal utility. Plus, the vast majority of enemies move so quickly that the tower will not be able to ramp up damage fast enough. Maybe in future content updates, it will have more of a use. But as it is right now, the Mad Scientist feels like a useless tower. Just try to argue that it's a better choice than the Sniper or even the Sheep, which isn't a great tower itself, but at least it has more of a use against Gator Riders and Abominations than the Mad Scientist does. Then, there's the Command Center, which has an especially bad design. The Level 1 Command Center gives a 20% buff to all towers in its range, a range so small that it will only affect a handful of towers. That's still assuming that there aren't obstructions from paths and scenery. Rather than buffing each of the towers in range by 20%, it evenly divides the buff. So if you have two towers in range, they each get half of the 20%, or only 10%. Why buff the damage of towers by only 20% total when you can use the same amount of money to get an actual attacking tower? By definition, that adds 100% effectiveness. The command center would probably work fine in another type of game, but Junk World discourages the use of that many towers. Income is scarce enough that you won't get to build much after each wave, and there are limits to the number of towers of each type that you can build. There's never a time when there are enough towers in one area to justify building a command center, going back to the fact that the game is designed to discourage choke points. Vengeance had a similar problem, where tower balance was so off that it created a meta. The Orc Shaman was so bad compared to the Mausoleum or the Blazing Gem. The only reason it may not have seemed that bad was because the game itself was easy. But Junk World is a demanding game with enemies that are hard to counter unless you're using the meta towers. Just so you know, the meta towers are the Machine Gunner, Lumberjack, Sniper, and Fire Trucker. These towers, with the exception of the Lumberjack, are the towers that you start the game with, and therefore, you have no reason to use any of the new towers that you unlock. At best, trying out new towers will be a break from using the meta strategy, but most likely disappointing since the towers are so bad that you basically can't win with them. At worst, it would be a waste of time and energy, in both senses of the word energy. Tower balance is about more than just fundamental design, though that is still the biggest factor. But the next biggest factor in determining the tower meta is the enemy design. To begin, the vehicle enemies are by far the most annoying enemies in this entire game. They're fast-moving enemies that cannot be blocked by units. Generally, in a tower defense game, you're supposed to have towers that can counter the strengths of enemies in strategic ways. If an enemy has armor, then you use a magic tower to bypass that armor, evening out the playing field by overcoming that enemy's advantage. If an enemy has fast speed, then you use towers to slow them or units to stop them, halting their speed so that they no longer have that advantage. But in Junk World, the vehicle enemies are explicitly immune to the one thing that makes the most sense to counter them with. So, instead, you have to treat them like flying enemies, just building towers along the paths they go down and trying to kill them that way. It's the most vanilla tower defense experience that you could possibly have. Watching enemies go down the path while your towers shoot at them and hoping that they do enough damage to actually kill the enemies because there's nothing you can do in the middle of combat to stop them. This isn't fun gameplay. Keep in mind that this further pushes for a meta. The machine gunner is arguably the best tower because of its fast fire rate. The machine gunner can at least consistently hit vehicles passing by, even if it doesn't kill them all. 
you just build more machine gunners along the path and hope that they do enough chip damage to each vehicle to kill them all. You're just as helpless against flying enemies anyways, so might as well double down and use up every machine gunner you have right away before even thinking about other towers. Of course, that's bad strategy. You're supposed to use a diverse array of towers to counter the different types of enemies, but Junk World isn't designed that way. It's time to talk about wave design. Waves in Junk World are about as soulless as they can get. Since the game is pretty fast paced, it's harder to notice this, but it actually has the same wave design as Vengeance. Enemies will trickle out one at a time rather than coming in the droves that Kingdom Rush 1 and Frontiers were more willing to spawn. It might not feel like a trickle because the enemies move faster than they did in Vengeance. However, they still lack the numbers to make you want to build towers that deal area damage. The only time area damage is warranted is when you try to force a choke point, but the wave design actively discourages it by spawning enemies in small sets. You might see 4 enemies of one type spawn from a path, all coming out one by one, then have a pause between spawns. Then, another set of a number of enemies will spawn, with yet another pause. It might be a set of enemies of a different type that come out one by one, but either way, it's all the same enemy type that gets spammed for a while, one by one. This makes it harder to form a meaningful choke point when enemies have this space between them. Additionally, these waves make the game feel one-dimensional. It doesn't have the same depth that waves used to have, which made you think about the way that enemies and towers can work in tandem, creating tons of possibilities out of the huge number of combinations. Junk World doesn't take advantage of any of its possible combos in its wave design. It makes it feel like there are very few enemies, since you rarely get a new experience going from level to level. On top of this, since the game just spams enemies, the solution is to spam towers that counter them. So, the towers that are the best at countering enemies are the ones that become meta. The biker is a good example of a spam enemy. It is a vehicle and is fast and unblockable by definition. You could try to use things like the explosive keg on them, but because they spawn one by one, the enemies are far apart enough that you can't realistically expect to get that much use out of any AoE attack on them. The only exception is the fire trucker, its fire attack lasts long enough to sometimes touch multiple bikers passing by if they really are close enough together. But like I said before about the fast attack speed of the machine gunner, the fire trucker in comparison is a poor choice to actively counter these fast, spaced apart enemies. Towers like the machine gunner are as meta as they are because of their attack speed, so your only effective option to counter this enemy spam is to use other fast attacking towers and tactics, which would include the turreteer and nothing else. Not only does this total lack of options speak for itself as a problem, this also exposes yet another problem with the game. You can only unlock new towers and tactics if you happen to get the cards for them from a loot chest, but the contents of a loot chest are entirely random, so you have to hope to get lucky enough to happen upon new options that can effectively counter the enemies you're fighting. Otherwise, you're stuck trying to make the current towers and tactics work. Furthermore, some cards are locked behind unlocking the second area, making it even harder to get cards you might want. The only reason this problem doesn't weigh down on the game much is because the starting towers are the meta for the most part, but because of the game's poor tower balance, I can't help but feel like this is mostly down to luck. If the meta towers ended up being other ones instead, then the game would become even more of an RNG fest than it already is. But the meta isn't just a problem for towers. Tactics also have a meta. At their core, tactics are basically the replacement for reinforcements and green of fire, you use them during defend mode to spawn units or cause burst damage, then wait for them to recharge. You can only get a recharge for units that are spawned once they die. The options you have to choose from are about as numerous as the towers, if a little less. Equipping the Misfits and Mad Mark to block enemies is crucial, since none of the barracks towers are effective in this game. After selecting those two practically mandatory tactics, the remaining two options have a couple of meta options that all completely eclipse the other options. For example, the Medic is a terrible choice fundamentally. It heals other units to help them block longer, but in that case, it would be better to just have another unit as your tactic instead. The Trashman can block enemies for a long time on their own, and like I've said with the Mad Scientist already, there are no enemies in the game who take so long to kill that you need to stack Trashman with a Medic to stall them. Most enemies that have any modicum of toughness also deal a ton of damage anyways. So, Instead of actually benefiting from stalling them, you're encouraged to try to shoot them down while they progress along the path unchallenged. This further pushes for the long-range sniper to be meta, in spite of its terrible RNG. Other tactics like the explosive keg or the mines are another meta choice. 
The only reason not to use the keg is when it's too hard to group up enemies consistently, which is somewhat often. But usually the reason for this is because of the spam of unblockable vehicle enemies who already cause a tower meta. You then have to focus on tactics that are able to shoot at the unblockable bikers whizzing past them, which means that the turreteer and harpooner are the next meta choices. But like the sniper, harpooners suffer from huge damage variants too. At level 1, they deal 3 to 17 damage, meaning that they can be 6 times more effective with good luck than with bad luck. Yet still, anything else is completely trash in comparison, because any other tactic comes at the cost of one of these meta choices that are clearly better. For example, why would anyone ever pick the Baron Von Bomber as a tactic instead of the other choices? All it does is hover above the ground and throw bombs, but its duration to cooldown ratio means that it won't be active for a significant portion of the time, and since enemies can easily break out of the choke points you try to form, they won't stay in range of the tactic to actually receive all of its damage output. It makes the explosive keg a purely better tactic on all fronts. This isn't meant to contradict what I said earlier about how the game discourages area damage. In the second environment, area damage sees more use because enemies start to spawn in better formations, but that doesn't mean that the problem with waves has gone away completely. I already explained how waves send out repetitive trickles of enemies with wide gaps between them. You can still see the repetitive swarms of enemies in the second environment. The reason it doesn't feel as bad as the worst of vengeance is because it doesn't feel like a trickle. This is because most enemies move so fast that they seem to just rush across the level, giving you no breathing room. At the same time, because of the one-dimensional way that enemies spawn, the whole experience combines to make levels barely memorable. With energy on the line, it's hard to want to come back for any of this. Pretty much every level suffers from being forgettable. Nothing distinguishes them from the same old wave design again and again, except for the paths. But paths aren't really memorable, so going from one level to the next doesn't feel like a new experience. The most standout levels are the ones that have environmental features like the tornadoes, but the tornadoes make the levels stand out as especially frustrating. They take all of the units, friend and foe alike, to the same spot on the map, making it chaotic and practically forcing micro. This can disrupt your choke points and stack up large groups of enemies. If you don't happen to have the explosive cake charged when this happens, all of the enemies form a wall that you can't stop. This makes the tornadoes a huge hassle. Sure, they add difficulty and something new, but that doesn't automatically make it fun. I'd be surprised if anyone considered the levels with tornadoes in them to be fun. Finally, I need to talk about the leveling system. The game has a permanent leveling system for your towers and tactics. When you level up any one card, it increases the damage and or HP by 10%. It's 10% of the starting stats. So for example, the explosive keg deals 100 damage at level 1. Upgrading to level 2 will add 10 damage for 110 total. Upgrading to level 3 will add another 10 for 120 damage total. Like I said, these upgrades are permanent, which means that if you go back to the early parts of the game, you will have overpowered cards. It kills any potential replay value that the game would have had. It also messes with your ability to analyze your strategy in the harder stages. How does a player know that they lost because of bad strategy, bad timing, or underleveled cards? Keep in mind that energy is being wasted while trying to figure these things out. There are many other nitpicks that I could go into, like the tutorial being too handheld, forcing you to buy things that you don't want to, and then immediately sending you to level 2. I could complain about the fact that melee engagement rules have stayed broken since Vengeance, when they worked completely fine in all of the games before this except on iOS. I could even go on about how most of the swamp levels are borderline unplayable because the flashing lights are so hard on the eyes. And now I have, but there are still even more complaints to be heard. But I think they are best heard from the rest of the community, to show how many other people feel this way. The game isn't all bad. Music and visuals are the best part of Junk World. It's just that the game has a lot to change before I could really enjoy the whole experience, or ever recommend it to someone else. Vengeance was a polarizing game in the community. Some people liked it, and others didn't. Then Legends of Kinemush came out, which was another controversy because it was exclusive to the Apple Arcade. Now with the release of Junk World, some people might see this as Ironhide's third blunder, but I don't think people should lose faith in Ironhide. Legends of Kinemush is proof that they can make a high quality game, it just happened to be platform exclusive. Ironhide hasn't lost its touch. Even though I didn't like this game, I'm still looking forward to whatever new content they make next. If you disagree with any of the points I've made, let me know. Like I said at the beginning, I'm curious to know if there's something I just wasn't getting about this game. But if you also found issues with this game and enjoyed hearing them called out, let me know that as well. It's important to stay on the same page, so that the community doesn't become more divided even if we have different opinions about the game. 
The last thing I want to say is directed to all of the developers at Ironhide who happen to be watching this. I wish I could make games as great as yours. I really look up to Ironhide Game Studio and how they embody fun in every sense of the word. I can't imagine a better video game company to be a part of. None of this video is intended to attack the company or the game. It's not intended to encourage anybody else to do so either. I'm sure you've heard much less respectful feedback from plenty of other fans before. This was just my experience of the game and possibly the experience of many other people. My hope is that this video starts a conversation that will help unify the community. But for now, I'm sticking to playing Legends of Kinemush because I fed up with this world.